a welcome to all the listeners. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you will be blessed and filled with the word of the Lord till it overflows, unable to be contained. But go forth from your lips that it may prosper in that thing the Lord has committed it to. May God be glorified in the name of Jesus. The message I bring to you today is titled, Why Should He Hear? How Should We Cry? This is a message upon prayer, proper prayer, proper approach, that we may get God's appearance. In James 5.16, says that we are to confess our faults one to another and pray for one another that we may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Fervent. The Greek word energio to be at work to produce effectual fervent. Avails. Itchio to be strong, powerful, able, prevail. We should be strong at the work of prayer. Romans 3.10 tells us, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 1.16 through 17 says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith, which had, was taken from Habakkuk 2.4. Now we are those who believe. Therefore God's righteousness is being revealed to us as we grow in our faith. Where do we grow in our faith? We grow in our faith in the valley. Therefore, after we pray and solely depend upon him for deliverance, blessing, help, or direction, he can now move us to our next level of faith. In Romans 3, 21 to 22, it tells us the righteousness of God is revealed through faith in Christ. Thus, our prayers are now effective. In Psalms 34, 15, it says, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. In 34, 17, it says, the righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. In Romans 9, 30, it tells us, Our righteousness is through our faith in Christ. The righteousness belongs to Christ as we belong to Christ. I say the above to say this. You belong to Christ. Then you are partakers of his righteousness. Hold fast the beginning of your confidence, steadfast to the end, knowing that God is in control, working things out for your good according to his will. So I say, stay fervent in prayer and be watchful for the manifestation of your supplication. Supplication, the Greek word thesis, prayer, request, petition. In Hebrews 10.37, it says, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Amen? We want to walk like think like, act like, believe like God is coming at this very moment God is going to make good on his promise of heaven, amen he is also going to make good on his promise to hear from heaven and have his eyes open and his ears attentive to prayers made in the temple because he's chosen, sanctified the house, his name is going to be there forever and his eyes and heart will be there perpetually perpetually that word that Hebrew word, yom, an indefinite period of time, continually, at all times. Second Chronicles 7, 14 through 16, it says thus, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. Now my eyes shall be opened and my ears attentive unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house. 
that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. I submit to you, brethren, that we are the temples in which he dwells. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? And it's not made by hands. Acts 17, 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Amen. I have two important scriptures on prayer to break down. One comes from Solomon. All the other from, other than properly placed, attorney calls may be monitored and recorded. And the other from Nehemiah. In Second Chronicles 6, in verse 14, Solomon declares God's sovereignty. He says in his prayer, and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven, nor in the earth, which keepeth covenant, and showeth mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. In verse 18, he declares God's greatness. But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and earth, heaven of heaven, of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house which I have built. In 19 through 21, he declares how often he wants God to be attentive to his prayer and forgive. Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and the prayer which thy servant prayed before thee, that thy eyes may be open unto this house day and night, upon the place whereof thou hast said that thou wouldest put thy name there to hearken unto the prayer which thy servant prayeth toward this place. Hearken therefore unto the supplications of thy servant and of thy people Israel which they shall make toward this place. Hear thou from thy dwelling place even from heaven and when thou hearest forgive. 22 to 26 he declares the type of sin that he needs to be forgiven for. If a man sin against his neighbor and an oath be laid upon him to make him swear and the oath come before thine altar in this house, then hear thou from heaven and do and judge thy servants by requiting the wicked, by recompensing his way upon his own head and by justifying the righteous, by giving him according to his righteousness. And if thy people Israel be put to the worst before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall return and confess thy name, and pray and make supplication before thee in this house, then hear thou from the heavens, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest to them and to their fathers. When the heaven is shut up, there is no rain because they have sinned against thee. Yet they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou doest afflict them. In verse 27, he declares his need to be taught how to walk by God. Then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and thy people Israel. When thou hast taught them the good way wherein they should walk and send rain upon thy land which thou hast given unto the people for an inheritance. In verses 28 to 30, he declares God is their provision. If there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, if there be blasting or mildew, locusts or caterpillars, if their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be, then what prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all the people of Israel, when everyone shall know his own sore and his own grief and shall spread forth his hands in this house, then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place and forgive. 
and render unto every man according unto his ways, whose heart thou knowest, for thou only knowest the hearts of the children of men. In verse 31, he declares his will for the people to walk in reverence to God, that they may fear thee to walk in thy ways, so long as they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. We learn from this. In Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah prays for his people. In verse 5, reverence of God, making mention of his glory, his mercy, and his willingness to forgive is made. Verse 5. said, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. In verse 6, a request to be heard by God is made and the frequency of the request is made known. Let thine ear now be attentive and thy eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servant, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. Verse 6 and 7, the confession of sin is made to God, not simply an admittance of an act, but viewing it as God does and take impersonal ownership of our actions. Not just they sinned, but so have I, God. Amen? So it says, And confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. In verse 8 and 9, he declares, reminding God of his own words, which he will not break. Praying the Lord's words back to him is most effective. Remember, I beseech thee, verse 8 says, that the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, if ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, Though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Verse 10, he declares the rule and authority of God over himself, and make intercession for others to receive the Lord's mercy, blessing, and deliverance. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. In verse 11, he prays to be heard. as in Psalms 19:14, Let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Declaring his reverence, restates his supplication and declares his dependence upon God. Somewhere along the way, the proper prayer life and proper approach to God has been lost or twisted by many in Solomon's day and Nehemiah's day. But Solomon and Nehemiah already were able to pray in the fashion that the Lord had to teach his disciples upon request in Luke 11, 1 through 4. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy All kingdom calls come. other than properly placed, attorney calls may be monitored and recorded. 
Thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let us get back to the proper prayer life, which is consistency, and the proper approach, which is humility, and with reverence to our Lord's sovereignty. Now let's find out how should we cry. Because we found out why should he hear. How should we cry? We should cry knowing he is the only one who can help us and is faithful to do so. Psalm 46 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 27 1. The Lord is the light of my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. One minute of whom remaining. Shall, shall I be afraid? Two. Cry as if our life depends on getting our message through. Three, how should we cry? Continuously. God is responsible for the answer. I conclude with this prayer. Let us go humbly with a heart that is open and honest, speaking truth to our Heavenly Father. Let us also go boldly, knowing our position and our walk of faith and our standing in Christ, and let our prayers reflect our submitted life. Let us honor God with praise while we sit upon our knees. But when we rise, refresh, let us honor God with our lives of worship, that he may receive all the glory. I say amen. Blessings upon you, brethren. They first took off his clothes. Then they took long leather thongs with steel pellets or lead pellets on the end and beat him across the back until he could hardly stand up. Then they put a crown of thorns on his brow and his face was bleeding. And they laughed at him and they spit on him and they mocked him. And with one snap of his finger, 72,000 angels had already drawn their swords ready to come to his rescue and wipe this planet out of existence in the universe. And Jesus said, no, to this end was I born. He wasn't just another revolutionary. He wasn't just another hippie. He was not just another great man. He was God in the flesh. And oh, the ethics that he taught. Never a man spake like that man. When you get hit on one side, he says, turn the other cheek. He never said what to do after that. But he did say, forgive 70 times seven, count that up. Jesus taught that we're to forgive. He taught a revolution in the way we're to live. He taught us that it wasn't just our outward actions that God judges, but it's the inward thoughts and intents. And he dragged and lifted and hauled that cross. He didn't squirm, he didn't yell, he didn't scream. He just took it and said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When he died on that cross, they nailed him, they put the nails in his hands. And you know what he said? Forgive them, they know not what they do. Forgive them. Could you forgive somebody that's putting nails in your hands and you know you didn't deserve it? Then look at the death he died. Did ever a man die like Jesus? The lightning flashed and the thunder roared and the earth began to shake. Has confessed that this must be the Son of God. Anyone that can see Jesus on that cross and not be touched has a heart of stone. And then on the cross. 
He said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he dropped his head and said, it's finished. What did he mean? He meant your plan of salvation was finished. God can now forgive you of all your sins because Jesus had finished God's plan for your salvation. Because you see, God knows every one of you by name. He has the hairs of your head numbered. 